Hello, everybody. Hope you can hear me. My name is Ahmed Dentz, Development and Artistic Associate here at San Diego Repertory Theater. And I would like to say welcome to We Are Listening. Uh, for those of you who have been here before, thank you so much for joining me, joining us, I should say, as I fix my camera very quickly. Um, thank you for joining us. Thank you for coming back to join us. If you've been here before, if this is your first time, thank you for being here with us. We have a great show tonight, a very special guest. We have some really interesting uh, stuff to talk about. But before we get into that, let me welcome back to the co-host chair, the one and only Jacole Kitchen. Jacole, come on in and step into the room with me. How are you doing? Hey, I'm Ed. Hey, everybody. It's so good to be back. I've missed you all. I got really upset seeing posters for this show, for this podcast being put out without my face on it. I was, I was hurt and offended, so I'm glad to be back. <laughs> well, we are glad to have you back and thank you so much for being back and uh, hope everything went well with directing. You know, that's why Jacole was gone. Oh, she was I directing a show at the uh, the Pop Tour at the okay. Playhouse and we're going to let her talk about that in just a minute. Before we get any deeper into this, everybody, I would like all of you to please make sure you have your cameras off. Make sure that you have your microphone muted. Right now, you should only be seeing me and Jacole. And uh, if you go ahead and click, uh, if you in your settings or if you click on um, hide all non-video participants, you should only see me and Jacole and our guest when we bring him on. But before we bring our guest on, we do have a couple of announcements we have to make. Number one, we would like to say congratulations to Jacole Kitchen, who is now the Director of Arts Engagement and In-House Casting at La Jolla Playhouse. Congratulations, Jacole. Moving on up, moving <laughs> on up. Congratulations. How does it feel settling into the, the, the new name and the new position? Uh, thank you. No, it's, it's wonderful and strange and wonderful. And I keep forgetting that I need to change my email signature to reflect <laughs> my, my new job, but it's, it's wonderful. I'm, I'm really excited um, to be taking on this new leadership position. Um, and in the engagement world and, and really the opportunities that that affords me to, to really continue the work and the conversations that are happening in this room and to really continue to um, solidify their place in the core of what we're doing over at La Jolla Playhouse. I'm really excited about it. Thank you. Well, congratulations and congratulations and a shout out to you and all the work you've been doing here in San Diego over the years and everything you're doing at the Playhouse. It is well deserved. We also have one more announcement to make. Me and my friend Bob would like to make a quick announcement. We want to say an early happy birthday to Jacole. Jacole's birthday is coming up on Sunday. So we wanted to make sure before we got the show going, I, I got my boy Bob to, to hook me up with a little something. <laughs> So me and Bob and everybody in the room just wanted to say before we get into the weekend and before we get into the show, happy 23rd birthday coming up, <laughs> this, <laughs> coming up on Sunday. So congratulations on the position and happy birthday to you. Thank you. Thank you. I'm surrounded by happy little trees right now. So thank you very much, Bob. Thank you, Ahmed. I appreciate it. Thank you very much. Thank you. And with that, with that being said, Jacole, why don't you go ahead and let us know what is going on uh, around your way at the Playhouse? Yeah, a couple exciting things coming on coming up in the month of May. Uh, one of them is a production towards belonging. Uh, that I'll, oh, I'll get to that one. Don't you worry. Um, towards belonging. That is a really beautiful spoken word and dance piece that was produced and curated by Anjanette Mariah Ramey and Mariah Performing Arts. Uh, it features spoken word by Gil Sotu and four amazing dancers, choreographed by Anjanette Mariah Ramey and the folks over at Mariah Performing Arts. Really beautiful piece. It's a love letter to San Diego, to Southeast San Diego, and the array of people who inhabit it. Um, so that is available for streaming starting May 1st. And then, of course, we have the 2021 pop tour, Pick Me Last, uh, by Idris Goodwin. We just were in the rehearsal room. We had a week of rehearsal on Zoom uh, with paper dolls. I was doing paper doll uh, blocking 
because I had a model of the set and little paper people. Um, and then we had two weeks in the room to rehearse this thing and put it on its feet. And then we had two days of filming and we'll have this thing ready to stream for free for educators, for schools, for families, uh, for any young folks who want to, uh, just get a little piece of theater in this hybrid medium of theater and film. Really spectacular piece, so much fun. It was a collaboration with the uh, third year UCMS, UCSD MFA acting graduate. Uh, just a really, really beautiful piece. Can't wait to share it with all of you. Cool, cool, cool. Everybody head on over to LaHoyaPlayhouse.org. Make sure you grab your tickets, get more information about both of those productions. Make sure you check out uh, Jacole's work. As you guys know, or may not know, if you don't know, I'll tell you now that uh, We Are Listening is produced by San Diego Repertory Theater in partnership with La Jolla Playhouse and the Old Globe. So I do want to bounce on over to the Globe and uh, instead of our uh, of our of our third wheel, who's never here with us, Mr. Freedom Bradley Ballantyne, uh, part of our curation team here on We Are Listening, we want to talk to you about Hamlet on the radio. This should be really fun. You know, Jacoba, the thing about this is like you were talking about what you had to go through. You know, dealing with rehearsing on Zoom, and you know, you know, just looking at this whole thing. I want to tell everybody who's listening, who's you know, kind of wondering, you know, what's going on. It's like. You know, we've, we've, we've had to adjust to the pandemic. We've had to adjust to this new, you know, digital world. And, but, you know, it's been hard. There's been growing pains, but there's some real innovation coming out of what's going on. And I think people are really digging in and seeing what they could do. We're, I think everybody could pretty much say we're doing more than we thought we could do. We're doing more Absolutely. things than we thought we could do with all these new tools and figuring out ways to bring productions um, to audiences. So it's just really a... a it's really a, a fun and curious time, especially as now we're looking back to getting back live, but we know that this is gonna be, you know, it's gonna be a hybrid of live and digital arts from here on, and that's just the world yeah. we're in. And it's really exciting. And I want you guys to hey, make sure you head on over to the oldglobe.org. Uh, they have a production of Hamlet on the radio. It begins on Friday, April 23rd through June 27th. Make sure you get on over to the oldglobe.org and check that out. That sounds like it should be really, really fun and interesting. And that's another thing that's happening is there's a lot of things coming out now, a lot of radio plays, internet plays, podcast plays, just a real innovative time in theater. And uh, we appreciate all of you for uh, sticking with us through this time as we, as we have been trying to figure out how to keep bringing art to you. Um, let me go ahead and bring things home for a minute here to San Diego Repertory Theater. Uh, great show we have streaming right now. It ends this Sunday on Jacole's birthday. It'll be the last day that you can stream it higher and higher. A rock and soul party starring Chester Gregory. He is doing all the Motown hits. It is high energy. You will love it. It's fun. Make sure you get on over to strep.org and check that out. And speaking of Idris Goodwin, how about Hype Man now streaming at sdrep.org? Make sure you uh, check this out. It is streaming through May 8th. And if I, can, if there is anything that is topical, if there is anything that is timely, it, it is this. This is a great play. And I, it, 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 there is a backdrop of police violence in it. And it, it is great. It is topical. It will make you explore. So please, uh, make sure you check that out. And then really quickly, and then we're going to bring our guest on. I want to get into a couple of We Are Listening notes. Uh, we have some spectacular guests coming up. I don't have uh, I don't have this first guest actually published yet, um, but I think it's a lock. So I'm going to say tentatively, uh, two weeks from now on April 29th, we will be welcoming Margot Hall. Margot Hall is a spectacular actor director and she is now the artistic director of the historic Lorraine Hansberry Theater. Lorraine Hansberry, a very, very powerful woman, powerful figure in the civil rights movement, was very close to James Baldwin, Medgar Evers. Um, so we are really hoping that we can really get that finalized. I think we're good. And as soon as we're good with that, I will make sure to let you know, but we wanna welcome her on April 29th, hopefully. And then on May 13th, we will welcome Calundra Smith. Calundra Smith is actually a theater critic and journalist based out of, out of Atlanta. I think she will be the first theater critic that we have had on. So it'll be really interesting to get her perspective as far as being a black theater sure. critic 
in this current, um, you know, this current place and time that we're in here. So that you can actually register for head on over to sdrep.org slash listening. I'll drop the link here in a couple of minutes. So you can register for that or watch on Facebook live. And that is going to do it for the announcements. I've really been looking forward to having this conversation. We're going to bring on Jeremy McQueen. Jeremy, why don't you go ahead and, and come on camera. Jeremy McQueen is an award-winning choreographer. He is also the founder of the uh, Black Iris, uh, the Black Iris Project. And uh, we're really looking forward to and, and thankful for having him here. Jeremy, how are you doing tonight? I'm good, thank you. I forgot I was on mute. <laughs> <laughs> I'm good, how are y'all doing? Good, 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 good. Thank good. you Glad for to hanging you out with us tonight. Thank you, thank you so much for having me. I appreciate it. And you're on, you're in New York, correct? I am, New York City. Okay, how, how's, how's, uh, how, how's the weather out there? What's, what's it looking like right now? Because I, I've, I usually pay attention to the weather um, nationally, but there's been so, um, so much other mess going on. I haven't <laughs> been able to keep up. How are you doing out there right now? I'm hanging in, you know, there's a lot going on in the world right now. It, it's raining today, which kind of mm. feels uh, serendipitous of, of mm. kind of my mood and how I feel about everything, but it's been, uh it, it's been a, a calm day to say the least on the outside good good well i'm, I'm glad i'm glad it's 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 I'm, I'm glad you're doing all right and i'm not gonna lie it's been a rough few days today was another rough day you know but i'm glad we can all sit here and and, and talk and, and and talk about some things jeremy why don't you go ahead and like i said i always say you know anybody can do introductions but we always like our guests to go ahead and do, do, introduce themselves a little bit to our audience why don't you go ahead and tell everybody a little bit about yourself a little bit about your background and, and how you progressed and got into this performing arts world sure of course um i jeremy mcqueen am a native of san diego california born and raised in southeast san diego um, I started dancing at a very young age, or actually I started in theater first. Um, my parents grew up in Alabama. They grew up in very large families and grew up fairly poor. And um, my dad had this dream of taking a leap of faith and moving to California and just trying something different. And so my parents uh, who met in college, they ended up moving to California and they, they vowed that they would expose their, their child or children to all the opportunities and things that they didn't get to experience at a young age. Um, so at a very young age, I was exposed to music, dance, theater. Um, but it was when I was about eight years old, my mom took me to see the national tour of the Family Opera when it came to the San Diego Civic Theater. And we got these nosebleed tickets all the way on the last row of the balcony, so high up that we could rent binoculars. And my mom rented these binoculars and I practically hogged them the entire time. I loved everything about the experience from the plush red seats that I sat on the edge of, from uh, the velvet curtains, the costumes, the scenery, being able to see the orchestra and the orchestra pit, everything about that experience just gave me chills in ways that I had never experienced before. Um, and it, it was just so different from watching movie musicals on television, the opportunity to see it live come before your, 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 your eyes and, and being able to hear and feel um, that cast members breathing was just, it was just so beautiful. And so I looked at my mom after that performance and I said, I, I crave more of this. I want to be a part of this. I didn't know if it would be as a musician in the orchestra pit or if it would be as a, a person pushing a, a set piece around backstage. I didn't care. I just knew that I wanted more of it. And so my mom and dad made a ton of financial sacrifices and investments in me and just really exposed me to anything that they could get their hands on. I started training in theater first at San Diego Junior Theater. Um, and I kind of went through the ranks of auditioning for shows there and whatnot. And I eventually started working professionally in theater at 15 years old doing uh, shows at what was the Starlight Bowl um, when they used to do their summer season of shows. And, um, but always keeping in the back of my mind that I want it to be a triple threat, a, you know, equal singer, singer, dancer, and actor, um, like the likes of Gregory Hines. Uh, and I knew that I wanted to be on Broadway. So moving to New York was a necessary evil of really wanting to get as much training and education and knowledge as I could before actually stepping out into the professional world. And, um, I came to New York and I studied at the Ailey.
I think we might be experiencing some technical difficulties there. Um, Med, do we know what's happening? I think someone didn't have their their that join didn't weren't was so we were getting some feedback. Yeah. Sorry about um, that. Please continue, Jeremy. No, you're fine. Yeah, this is fine. It's I mean that's that's the world we're living in right now on Zoom every day, day in, day out for a year. So I get it. Um, but yeah, I moved to New York uh, about 16 years ago to to gather a, a stronger education in the arts. And I attended the Ailey Fordham BFA program, which is a really unique collaboration between the Alvin Ailey American Dance Theater and Fordham University. And then ever since I've just been here uh, pounding the pavement first and foremost as a, as a performer, dancing in a number of different Broadway shows and dancing with the Metropolitan Opera and all kinds of stuff. And then more recently um, in the last, I'll say at least eight years uh, dedicated just to really fostering my career as a choreographer. I'm not you're on mute. <laughs> of course I'm on mute because that's what we do now. <laughs> we forget to unmute ourselves. <laughs> <laughs> um, how was the transition? How was the, tra first of all, what part, I, I gotta get, what part of Alabama was your family from? Um, my parents are from Montgomery. I am from, I, my family is from Midway from Midway, Alabama, which is just about 40 minutes outside of Montgomery. I was the first person in my family born in, in California. Uh, my dad took the family, took my brother, sister, my mommy's in the Navy. They went all around the country, ended up, he retired here in the Navy in San Diego. So that's how I ended up here. So it's funny just hearing those kind of, uh, that, that kind of parallel, you know, trajectory. How was your transition going from San Diego to New York? Oh, geez, I hardly remember it now, but, <laughs> but um, you know, it was fine. I, I think I prepared myself in a way that I always, I had visited New York as a child and I was always enamored by the bright lights, but I, I knew that, at least in high school, I knew that living in New York and being surrounded by people uh, that are so much stronger and greater than you was going to propel me, but it was also going to present a number of challenges psychologically. Um, so I, 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 did, I, I wouldn't say I really had a whole lot of challenges. I tried to just constantly remind myself that this was my dream, even though I hadn't achieved the goals of the Broadway shows that I wanted to be in just yet, you know, even just living in New York and being able to wake up and walk to Central Park or do something of that nature um, continued to propel me and, and feed my spirit positively um, whenever I felt homesick or sad or depressed about whatever was going on. Can you talk a little bit about the difference of the, the sort of artistic climate as a black artist in San Diego versus New York. And I know you were a very young artist when you were here in San Diego and before you transitioned to New York, but just very curious about just, yeah, the, the, the cultural competency, the, the artistic culture um, as, yeah, as a, a young black artist in the two cities. Yeah, I'll say definitely in San Diego, I felt that I was one of very few. I. I'll, I'll rephrase. So I went to San Diego School of Creative and Performing Arts for middle school and high school. And there I really felt like I understood what diversity was. We had so many different um, ethnicities and cultures brought into one campus and our administration, our faculty, it really reflected a lot of diversity at that time. So many of the dance teachers that I had at at SEPA were black or people of color. And I think that that connection was something that really helped me a lot because one, one teacher in particular, Donald Robinson, um, who's a San Diego icon, uh, he really gave us not just dance skills, but he taught us life skills. Um, one of the biggest lessons that I feel like I, I continue to resonate from him in my life is discipline. And he used to say, discipline is doing what you know you're supposed to be doing, even when no one's there to make sure you do it. 
And um, that was something that, you know, we could take with us even outside of the dance room. Like he taught us that being on time uh, means to be early. If you're on time, that means you're late, you know, things of that nature. I think he was really preparing us. So um, at SCPA, we were in this little bubble of diversity, but at the same time, um, he was giving us tools to learn how to code switch and how to really uh, maneuver throughout life as, as people of color. Now, outside of SCPA, I did a number of, of, like I said, junior theater, and I studied at California Ballet, a number of different institutions where I was often one of very few. And I knew very early on that I was an anomaly. Um, a lot of times my parents, especially being from the South, they were very skeptical about any time someone would want to give me a scholarship to attend you know, their school or their program or whatever. And one of the questions that I remember my parents asking me was, you know, well, how many black kids are at the school or how many are, are in your classes there? And then they would also ask, you know, and are there any people of color on faculty or in the leadership? And at the time I didn't understand that, but a lot of times my parents would make their decisions about how they would position me and where they would position me based on those demographics and, and, and that genuine sincerity of wanting to have me there because they wanted to nurture and support my talent, not because they just wanted to check off uh, that they have black kids on a list for grant applications. Um, so my parents, you know, growing up in Alabama in the 50s, 60s and 70s, they, they knew a lot about what to expect and about affirmative action. And they wanted to make sure that I was really get, getting a quality education that was gonna help me, but they always kept me very rooted and grounded in understanding who I was and the uniqueness of my blackness and understanding that that's both gonna come with challenges as well as victories. Um, but um, yeah, you know, the difference between, I would say studying dance in California, California has more of a, a laid back vibe. You know, we've got the rolled tacos and the beach and everything is just so, you know, everyone's calm, everyone's generally pretty happy, at least that's how it felt as a kid. New York is polar opposite, you know, like they're super focused, they're hyper focused, it's not as sunny, there's there's really no good Mexican food anywhere in the city. <laughs> it's um, so true. <laughs> you know, it's just, it's, it, was a, it was a great contrast. Um, but like I said, those, the, the things that my parents instilled in me as a young age, as well as my teachers, I felt like really prepared me for what I was gonna experience. Um, specifically at Alvin Ailey, it was almost going from one bubble from San Diego SCPA, going to the Alvin Ailey American Dance Theater, which is a very diverse institution um, that is mm -hmm. primarily led by black artists, right? So um, being surrounded by so many people that looked like me, um, was encouraging in so many different ways and being able to hear of their stories of the challenges and the triumphs that they've had um, definitely propelled me. But um, there have definitely been some eye-opening experiences to say the least in New York as I continue to get older and, and mature more and, and especially learning more um, as a choreographer on the other side of the table, um, just in terms of casting and, and stereotypes about being a black man and what that looks like so it's um it, it's definitely been a challenge to say the least but um uh i i always cherish being able to come back and connect with my san diego theater communities i think um, you'll be happy to know too oh so sorry just real quick i met i yeah. just i, I just want to comment that i love that even back when you were at scpa that that was that that was a reality, that there was diversity in the teaching staff and in the um, in the student body as well. And that is something that to this day has continued with SCPA. Mm -hmm. um, I know that the ensemble, the partnership productions between San Diego Rep and SCPA, uh, they have really provided a lot of diversity on the stages. I mean, it was the students at SCPA that made up Washington Heights for us when, when I was there and we did um, in the Heights, it's just, it's, it's, and, and the faculty, it's the same. Like I, so I just, I love hearing that, that that has, that the school has been around for a while, but that that has always been part of their core and a commitment that they have. Oh yeah. I, you know, I, I, I'm not so connected to SCPA now, but, um, SCPA has always been such a safe haven. You know, it's, um, it was it's just so, such a safe environment to come and explore and learn and, about yourself and who you want to be. Um, you know, now it's it's 
very different um, in the sense that you have to audition. We didn't have an audition process. It was like, mm. you kind of got picked by a lottery or you went to a theater school. Um, and so we were really mixed with a lot of kids from all different neighborhoods and some that were super focused on, knew what they wanted to do and knew who they were. And then there were other kids that would dibble and dabble and they'd move around from doing choir to dance to art to really figure out like what their voice is. And I really, um, I really loved that, that aspect of being able to, um, developed your own voice uh, while, while, while not in such a pressureful environment like New York, where you have to like know what you're doing and be out there and promote yourself and go for it. So, mm -hmm. you know, uh, looking at you and then looking at the success of Andre Day and it just it, what it, and, and the work that we've done, you know, with the school, it just it 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 really speaks to the legacy that they have, and also I've done a couple of talkbacks with Richard Trujillo over the last couple of months there. And they're even more engaged to do more. They're even now even more engaged to push forward in the even more diversity and how do they keep diversity and how do they make sure they're speaking to people. So it's just, it's just a real, it, just, just to hear you talk is it, just a real um, tribute, you know, to what they're doing and, and what they have going on over there. One thing that uh, you said, and, and is so important that we're dealing with right now is, you know, what we see what we see as children, what we see as young people, what inspires us. And you mentioned, um, you mentioned Gregory Hines. And like, you know, for me, when I was a kid, like, yeah, Gregory Hines was like, that's one of our black heroes right there. You know, like, you know, just, just seeing his acting, his dancing. Um, expand on that, could you, a little bit more about what, 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 that, what that meant for you to see especially someone with the caliber of Gregory Hines just doing, you know, and that continues and that just that legacy that I think maybe might be overlooked right now, might not be talked about as much as it should be. It's all the great black dancers, tap dancers. The, like I remember at the Spreckles when the, my dad worked at the Spreckles and so at the Spreckles theater a block from here. And I remember him bringing me home these Alvin Ailey posters because the yeah. day I went on tour and they went to the Spreckles. And I remember, look, I remember sitting in the garage when he gave me those posters. And I remember just looking at them because I was in awe because I was just seeing these black bodies doing things in shapes that I had did not see them doing on TV. You know what I mean? Can you speak to me a little bit about what that was for you to see that inspiration or to see that at that age? Yeah, the visibility and the, the access um, was instrumental to be able to see someone who looks like you um, doing such extraordinary things on incredible platforms has always been an invaluable experience for me. And I, and I completely credit um, so many people. Uh, you know, one of the things about Mr. Robinson and Bill Doyle and a number of the, the teachers that I had um, during that, that, that legacy of SCPA um, many of them, they had students that went on to do incredible things at uh, Brian Stokes Mitchell, who went on to win Tony Awards on Broadway, um, Sada Ramirez, um, Christian Hoff, who didn't go to Wait, SCPA. Wait, Stokes but, went to SCPA? Uh, yeah, I don't, I don't think it was SCPA at the time. I think it was called O'Farrell maybe at the time, oh, but it was mm, like O'Farrell SCPA yeah, or something. Yeah. But wow. I just, yeah. I remember, and I don't think he graduated from SCPA. I think he graduated from a different school. Mm -hmm. um but I yeah it, like the thing that I remember about SCPA is that our teachers used to tell us about their students you know Ananda Lewis um mm -hmm. Sada Ramirez there were so many people that they would tell us about these people have gone on to do these things and you can too and yeah. and a lot of times those uh alumni would come back and they'd lead master classes and they'd talk to us Jeffrey Gerodius was one person that I remember um, who had graduated from SCPA and then later on went on to dance in the Alvin Ailey American Dance Theater for many, many years. Um, and it was really that one-on-one -on -one interaction with all these people, Michelle Kamaya, who was in Lion King for many, many years, having that uh, ability to see that someone from your own neighborhood of Southeast San Diego has gone on to do these incredible things was definitely what per continually propelled me with inspiration and encouragement. Um, I don't know if SCPA still does that. I know a lot of myself and uh, my alumni friends, we always feel like uh, perhaps SCPA doesn't really understand the legacy in the ways that we do. So I'm not sure that they're able to share that with their student body. Um, and we've always talked about wanting to be more in, engaged with, um, 
with the SCPA community than they've invited us to be, um, because we know firsthand just, just how important that access to those people, to be able to have those intimate conversations of what is it like to be a person of color in New York? I mean, I can't tell you how much that has helped me. And that's why I say the transition from going from California to New York, it didn't scare me because all of the people around me fully prepared me for what I was about to step into. Mm, mm, interesting. Um, I want to talk to you also, I want to talk to you about the Black Iris Project and and talk to me a little bit about that, about the founding of it, what, what that's all about and, and why you felt the, the need to to create this. Yeah, I was thinking about this because I figured it might come up in conversation. And it's actually a story I've never told before. Mm. Um, pe people are so used to hearing um, what they typically hear me say about Black Iris Project. But there's a piece of that puzzle that I've, um, I've left out because it's been a challenging conversation to have. But long story short, my mother was uh, diagnosed with breast cancer in 2012. And I was in New York. Um, hustling and bustling as an artist and my mother and my father, they know how hard and how demanding and how stressful it can be at times. And so my mother and father made the decision to not tell me until it was absolutely necessary. I was in Salt Lake City, Utah, doing a production of In the Heights. And I had purchased a ticket for my mom to come and see my opening night. I was like, no, I want you to come and see this. Um, and she got on the phone with me I want to say maybe it was like oh, maybe a few days before opening night and she said you know I have something to tell you um, that I've been keeping from you and she was like I've been undergoing breast cancer uh, treatments for a number of months and I wanted to tell you because you were going to know because I'm wearing wigs etc and so forth um, and it was after that experience that I was back in New York um, after some time and I was with a friend and he was like, you know, let's go to the Metropolitan Museum of Art. I had never been before, but it was just something to get me out of the house and do something different. And while I was there, I fell in love with this painting by Georgia O'Keeffe entitled Black Iris Three. And um, I just, that painting gave me the same shockwave feeling that I had the first time I saw Femme of the Opera. So I knew that there was something there because there's been moments in my life and my career where I've had this feeling and I, I know that it's something. Um, and I've continually tried to chase after it. So what I ended up doing was walking us all around the museum just to bring us back to that painting um, so I could spend more time with it. And as I continue to look at the painting and think about just the beautiful texture and the lines and the color and the complexity, complexity excuse me, and the depth, um, I started thinking a little bit more about my mother, my godmother, and my aunt, three Black women who, to me, truly personify what it means to be Black, to have courage, faith, strength, determination. Um, you know, for my mom to have been going through these treatments for so long by herself. Um, I just thought about the strength of that and the strength of growing up as a Black woman in the South in the 50s, 60s, and 70s. Um, it just inspired me so deeply. So at the time, I had an application due for the Joffrey Ballet's Choreographers of Color Award. And um, one of my college mentors had always encouraged me to just take how I'm feeling and throw it into my art, use it as the foundation for which I built. And um, I decided to conceptualize this idea to create a ballet entitled Black Iris, simply in tribute to those three women with them in mind. Um, but the part of my story that I don't often tell is that connection of In the Heights. Um, I was cast in uh, Pioneer Theater Company's production of In the Heights without a single audition. I was cast purely by my headshot. Um, at the time, it was a low cut fade, very kind of like sinister, very straight, legit theater, theater face. Um, and the choreographer had reached out to me on Facebook who knew me from auditions, but we had never worked together and was like, hey, we're considering people for uh, this role of Graffiti Pete in, in the Heights. We think you'd be great. And I was like, okay, great. Do I need to submit like a, a reel or do you want to send me some sides to put on tape? And it was like, no, 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 no. Just give me, you know, I'll, I'll grab your headshot and resume from the website. I'll talk to the director and we'll take it from there. 
red red flag number one. Like who casts people to play a speaking role with no audition and you don't really know the people. Um, nevertheless, it was an equity contract. You know, I needed my health insurance weeks. It was an opportunity to step outside of my comfort zone and do something different, even though I myself was like, wow, okay, well, I don't really rap, but we gonna give this a shot. Um, That's what I was thinking, Graffiti <laughs> P. You don't cast Graffiti P without seeing him dance and hearing him rap, like period. <laughs> yep. Period. So I, I, I knew that this was gonna be an experience, but I had no idea just how much of an experience it was. I mean, we're talking about Pioneer Theater Company. Yes, I am naming names. Um, and we're talking about a primarily white producing team. Uh, from what mm -hmm. I remember, it was an all white artistic team. And mm -hmm. let me tell you the trauma that I experienced. Um, the moment I walked in the door and I introduced myself to the director, it was like, I saw this terror in his face, like, oh my God, what have I done? And in that moment I knew, oh, I, you, you thought you were going to, oh, you don't like my voice. Like in my head, it was like, oh, you thought you were going to get, you know, cousin Jerome from down the street and not Jeremy McQueen. <laughs> like I, you know, it was, they had, a, apparently the director had these very preconceived notions based off of my headshot and my previous credits and whatever of what I was going to walk in the room and sound like and talk like. And from that moment on, I was like, oh my God okay, just buckle up, here we go, just just focus on the work. Um, but at every juncture, it was so hard. I mean, we talk about it a lot behind closed doors as black actors and dancers about sipping, drinking the Kool-Aid, right? You wanna drink the Kool-Aid just to keep right. your job and to you know shuck and jive to keep everybody happy and keep work and keep get, getting those health insurance weeks coming in. But it just got so hard to continue to do that, I mean, the things that this gentleman would say about people of color trying to connect his experiences as a white Jewish man to being able to understand uh, racism or community or, or culture that he's really a spectator of. It was just, um, it, was, it was profoundly inappropriate. Um, and I kept looking at my cast members like, this is weird, right? What made it even more the weird was um, they had hired a dialect coach for many of us. And it was a white British woman from the UK who had done a number of, uh, uh, I guess she had worked on The Hobbit and a number of things. And the director decided that he wanted me, he didn't like my voice and he didn't like the way that I changed my voice just with, with my own acting, whatever, um, that he decided he wanted me to sound more like LL Cool J. And so I had- I'm sorry, number. specifically LL Cool J. I mean, they would have me sit and watch videos during rehearsal, listening to LL Cool J speak. They would have me repeat things the way that he said them. And then I would have to listen to this white British woman oh my God. <laughs> tell me that I wasn't doing it right. I mean, when you talk about just like, I mean, I've never told this story before, but I was like, oh, I can't wait to share this tonight because it was absolutely insane. Um, yeah just the level of disrespect and trauma and all of us were kind of just taking it and just trying to embrace it as much as we could but apparently and pioneer is not a short contract right a pioneer if you're work doing a show at pioneer you're there for a minute am, am i right yeah well let me tell you what happened next so <laughs> it gets better so i didn't actually make it to my opening night of in the heights um the creative team i guess because i wasn't sipping the kool-aid enough uh, decided that even though I was working, I was working my butt off to try to make this work. Um, apparently it wasn't good enough. And they decided to buy me out of my contract, which I didn't even know at the time was possible. Um, and it was the day that tech started, which I believe would have been like the cutoff for them to make that decision. But they had called me to a meeting with the entire like artistic and producing team. And um, they basically let me know that I was going to be going home that day with full salary. I was going to continue to be paid and I was going to continue to receive my, uh, you know, insurance weeks. But they had made an executive decision to, to let my understudy play the role and said, um, I mean, I was I was heartbroken. I was devastated. I was confused. I was upset, angry, furious. 
Um, they told me I was going to be paid my full salary. So I didn't really put up a fight and they told me they'd already booked my flight. So I said, okay, well, I'm just going to go home and figure this out. But when we really talk about the inception of the Black Iris Project and what made me want to make it um, from more than just a ballet to more of a collaborative idea of, uh, of creating our own stories was because I was, I had that experience and I was so fed up and tired of our stories as people of color being told and translated by others that have nothing to do or have no personal knowledge of our, of our stories or of, of, of what this means and what this feels to be a person of color. And so it was my goal to be able to highlight and bring together um, particularly black artists um, from all different genres and mediums from lighting design, costume design, scenic design together to tell our own stories and to create our own narratives and not continually be in the situation where our stories are being told by others and they're not accurately being told. You know, um, one of the things I'm very cognizant of is black is not a monolith. There's so many colors and varieties of who we are and complexities within that. And so um, I wanted to create an organization that would showcase and celebrate our diversity. Um, as well as uplift our voices and, and our stories that need to be told our way. Yeah. Yeah. Sorry. Wow. I know. I, I know. I just no, kind of slipped you, you guys. <laughs> slipped you guys. Whoa, no, you blew <laughs> my mind. And I know we want to keep the focus on the Black Irish Project. And, and I know that Ahmed has uh, some more questions about that. But man, you just blew my mind. No, we can, we can stay on that because, I mean... <laughs> This is originally what this platform was created for, was for these types. You know, I was just watching, I shared this in artistic meeting today. I was just watching an interview with Richard Pryor when he was on the Dick Cavett show. And Dick Cavett, for as much as he is throughout his history when he was hosting the show, was an ally to black people, bringing everybody on I me mean, from James Baldwin to whatever. And he asked Richard Pryor if a white person could write for him. And Richard Pryor's answer was so simple. It was so, he was like, well, yeah, if he writes me as a human being, as long as he doesn't try to write me as what he thinks I'm supposed to say or how I think I'm supposed to act. And as for as smart and as intelligent and as culturally curious as Dick Cavett was, this was probably the worst time I ever, this to that simple thing, he didn't know how to stay on track with that. And he went in to say, well, I think I could do it. And, and you just see Richard's expression looking at him like, dude, you don't know what you're talking about, but, but, but you're, what you're saying is so topical because we're still dealing with that today, dealing with these people's memes of what we're supposed to be or what we're supposed to sound like or what we're supposed to, you know, in their head, like, oh no, you're, you're not, you're not sounding like a black person, right? I know you're black, but you're not being the right type of black person. You're not sounding like a black person should sound right now. You're not looking like a black, you're not reacting how a black person should react to this. What is, what is wrong with you? Until literally, I literally heard a little bird say recently that they thought a black writer didn't write a black boy right in a play. And I'm like, well, as someone who was once a black boy, <laughs> I think he got it right. <laughs> you know, but, but no, that's why I wanted to stay with that because people need to understand this. This is not gone anywhere. This is not, this is not left. This is not gone anywhere. Mm -hmm. Cool. Yeah. No. <laughs> No, it's just, it's, it's, it's so deep. It's, it's so deep because it's one thing to, okay. So we're finally at a point where we're able to write our own stories. And there's, there's part of me that is uh, getting flashes of um, the 40 year old version. Uh, Rada, what's her name? That's on Netflix right now. Uh, doesn't matter, but that we finally have a voice. We're finally able to tell our stories because the thing that makes in the Heights amazing is not just that it's black and brown bodies on stage, that it's it's a story of a community of, written by people from that community. And so, and that's what makes it beautiful and spectacular. And it's like, yes, telling our stories. 
And then you get somebody in who says Graffiti Pete should sound like LL Cool J because that's the reference that they have. That is the only, like, this is the, it's, but then you have the flip side of it in a play that the rep did a couple years ago where I'm going, if you've never met a black person, don't try to write a black character because it's obvious you've never met a black person by the way you have written this black character. Black people don't say that. That's what white people think black people would say. And and again, this, you're right, Ahmed, this is where this, this, this program started. This is not where we are. This program is about a celebration of black artists and the work that they are creating. And yes, some of that work is created from places of real trauma. <laughs> And, and and forgive me, Jeremy, I've been away for a couple of weeks. I haven't, I haven't been <laughs> triggered for a while like this publicly. Um, but let's keep this about the celebration of the art for a moment. We'll, we, we'll curve back because I, I do have a couple of just general follow-up questions. Um, <laughs> but, but let's keep this about the art. I'm at, uh, get us back on track. <laughs> yeah, Jeremy, that's how we get down here. <laughs> Um, that was that. That was my version of diplomacy. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, we're being on good behavior tonight. Uh, uh, and so, and 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 with that, with with the Black Iris pro, with the Black Iris project, I want to get into a little bit of. Uh, I really want to talk to you about Wild Act One and why it's so important to me and why I think, um, you know, if people didn't see it, I'll I'll, I'll throw a link in the chat to the. Uh, it was a. a I watched a talk that you did with the Sorensen Center for International Peace and Justice, which is really good, really, really great talk. And I, I want to throw that yeah, in the link. Great interview. Check it out when they have time. But um, before I get into what I think about it, why don't you? Uh, and I know what it, it just you it just stopped streaming this Sunday. Wild Act One. Why don't you describe everybody a little bit of exactly what it was, and then I want to talk to about why. I feel it's so important for things like this and other projects to really be injected in art right now. Can you talk to us a little bit about what Wild Act One was or is? I yeah, say. yeah, absolutely. Well, I'll, I'll talk a little broadly and then I'll work my way down. Um, I recently was given a, a Soros Justice Fellowship from Open Society Foundation. Um, and as part of the, the fellowship, it, it's really diving deep into the criminal justice system and analyzing and offering perspective and suggestions on ways that we can reform and, and create change and evoke change and move forward. And um, so I, I ended up deciding to, to break down this ballet that I wanted to create called Wild into four parts. Um, they're titled similar to, as you would see, a regular stage performance, Overture, Act One, Entre Act, and Act Two. Um, <clears throat> Act One in particular um, goes deeply into the juvenile justice system, really looking at one young male's experience um, celebrating his 14th birthday um, behind bars and kind of understanding what that experience can look like for some young people, um, specifically black and brown people who are uh, continually systemically impacted by the criminal justice system. Um, so we get to kind of see a, a range of emotions throughout the course of one singular day um, of, of what that experience is kind of like. Um, Overture was more of a, a introductory film which kind of outlined a number of situations or reasons why a young person might find themselves entangled with the justice system. Um, Act one goes directly into the justice system. Um, Entre Act deals with um, coming home, um, re-entry, re-entry into society. And then um, Act Two will, uh, will work specifically with looking at restorative justice and what a world without prisons can look like and, um, and all of that. So I, did I just answer your question? Ahmed, you're on mute. <laughs> Of course, no, uh, no. That 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 is it, it. That's exactly what I wanted to get into. What was um, what was the uh, what was the inspiration or what was the process of turning this into turning this experience or this issue, I should say, for lack of a better word, into dance? Like, what was the imperative to to try to turn this into actual dance? 
Um, so with Black Artists Project, I'll say most of the works that we do are, are, are social justice related. Um, usually my work is based on things that either I've experienced or that I've observed or that I'm deeply connected to or that my, I find that my community is affected by. And so specifically with WILD, it was a trip to the Equal Justice Initiative in Montgomery, Alabama that I fell in love with. Um, I had that same Phantom of the Opera, Black Iris feeling when I saw this portrait by Richard Ross of a young 12 year old boy um, who was staring at his walls in his um, detention bedroom. And I think he was about 12 years old at the, at the time. Um, but the walls were just covered in, in writings and etchings and carvings. And I was just so struck by it thinking about the numbers, the droves of, of young men and women who have probably lived in this room at some point and have been affected by this system. Um, but one thing that was just over the young boy's head were the words North or nothing. And it had a picture of a spaceship. And I started to think about just the incredible amount of creativity this young man might have um, in terms of not being limited by his circumstances, but being able to dream and see beyond his, his, the four concrete walls that held him back physically. And I was so inspired by that. And I started to think a little bit about my own journey of, of being a young boy in San Diego who really knew nothing of what it was going to tangibly be like in New York City. But I always had this dream of wanting to express myself through art so much so that I would you know, sequester myself in my bedroom for hours on end, writing uh, costume, drawing costume sketches or, or creating set designs and creating choreography. Like I did the whole thing. And um, I just started to think about the power of the imagination and how strong so many young men and women must have had to and continue to have to be during such challenging situations as these. Um, and so using my own personal inspiration, as well as um, the amount of research that I've done, um, whether it be personal interviews or um, reading books. Um, I collaborated with Richard Ross, who for over 10 years had gone into detention centers and photographed and interviewed kids and asked them about their background, their history, whatever, whatever they were comfortable sharing with them, he put pen to paper. Um, to really amplify their voices. And I felt like, especially during this time period, it was so necessary for us to amplify voices that often go um, unheard or unrecognized. So um, within bringing this to life through, through movement, I think that arts, particularly dance, is just so powerful in the ways that we're able to kind of um, address and look at social justice topics in a very different way. It takes it away from the panel dis discussion. It takes it out of the protest and it can provide us at times um, just a, a, a fairly distant way to look at a situation and also possibly explore possible outcomes of how we can change the narrative or even bring people to the conversation, to the table, to be able to understand why we're protesting, why we're having these discussions. Um, and, and movement has always just been such a medium for me that has been so um, powerfully evocative, being able to express so many ideas um, with even just gestures or mannerisms, um, you know, the really humanizing, um, these young men and these experiences. So dance just felt like a natural medium to be able to um, show the dissonance of um, them wanting to express themselves, but people not really being able or willing to hear them. Yeah, the, the reason so I, I really, I, I wanted to focus on that and then, you know, maybe we can move into the, the, the social justice aspect of it. And then I'll jump off my soapbox and let, and let Jacole ask something. I, I The reason why it's so important to me is that you know, Nicole, we've had these discussions where I say, I, you know, when you see stuff about prison on TV, you see things about incarceration on TV, it's just su it's, most of it's such trash. Most of it is just such trash for how important a situation it is. And, you know, my experience with that, you know, the cl probably closest you'll get is maybe lockup because it's just kind of this blank whatever. But lockup doesn't capture the like torturing of the soul the, the 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 search for the redemption the really pain of the family members who you know they say you know it's, it's it's true when you know when you get locked up it's not just you your whole family gets locked up as well if you're close because they're doing that time with you and it's hard for that 
some of it's sensationalism, some of it's just for ratings, but it's hard to really capture that. And when I watched this, this is one of the few things I watched where I was like, oh, oh, I'm feeling the pain. Like, I'm feeling the isolation of that man in that cell, that kid in that cell. And what people don't understand, yeah. especially here in California, for years, kids have been locked up at 13 and 14, especially in the 80s when you know things were really crazy. Kids were getting locked up at 13 and 14 and given 17 and 15 and 21 years to life. So they were going from California Youth Authority straight to the penitentiary. And that's a man, that's a kid going from 13 into his 40s and 50s. Nothing but concrete walls, iron doors, whatever. And it's really hard to convey what that, that doesn't matter what, there are so many people who've gone through their, you know, they've gone through their time of being changed and being rehabilitated. It doesn't matter. Not going home. It doesn't matter. They've been rehabilitated. They're a completely different person. It doesn't matter. But watching, you know, watching what you did with that, it really conveyed what that pain was and what that struggle was. And even looking at the visitation scene and seeing the back and forth because people think, oh, well, if someone comes to visit you, it must always all be good. No, it's not. There's pain, there's problems. There's still problems at home. There's pain, you know, um, you know, really quickly, one of my favorite movies, uh, King of New York, you know, there's, there's a couple of scenes that talk about that, that you captured. There's a scene where Frank White, who's the main character, he's a big gangster. He knows the mayors and everything. He comes home and the first thing he has to do, like when he comes home, he has to go to this play. He actually has to go to a play that night with all the big wigs and it's a play about prison. And it's like so ridiculous and everyone's clapping. And he's just sitting there rolling his eyes. You know what I mean? Like, like he's just sitting there going like, oh, you guys think this is what this is about. And it just reminded me of that, looking at what you did with this choreography. It is so powerful. Like it really, I, I don't, I have to keep saying that because it just is like if it, it it was so powerful in actually conveying, putting that pain in a place where it could really be felt. It could really be felt through the movement and through everything. So I, I just, I, I just wanted to give you a shout out because that's that's something that is hard to do, and that is something that is so important that needs to be understood by the greater society of what is going on in these prisons, especially when you're locking young boys and girls up at 13, 14, 15, and then you take away everything that's rehabilitative. You take away the chance to get a college degree. You, you take away these things and then they're supposed to come home and be fine. They're supposed to just step back in society and be all great and good. So I, I just wanted to give you a big shout out on being able to convey that, that, that pain and, that, and what that experience was. Thank you, thank you so much. I appreciate that. Um, truly, it's... Um, I've told people I've, I've lost a lot of sleep um, over the last number of months um, because for me, it's, it's been wanting to authentically, sensitively um, share these stories in a way that, that they would provide authenticity you know, to the experience. Um, and so my wanting to get it right <laughs> um, has been, has been um, a good thing and a, and a bad thing, but, but it's mm. been, um, you know, it's, um, I, I really care about our people and the liberation of our people and, and being able to help provoke the change um, that needs to occur ar across so many gamuts. And so um, I'm, I'm proud and I'm happy and humbled to do this work. And it's just so heartwarming and fulfilling to, to hear that you and, and so many others have been positively impacted by it. I, I truly appreciate it. It's, it's, the, it's the most rewarding thing to, to ever hear, um, especially to hear the ways in which people now want to get more involved. Um, one person reached out to me on Instagram and was like, if there was only a way that we could connect with these young people and provide them with inspiration, encouragement. I was like, but wait, there is, there are ways, <laughs> there are organizations you could connect, you can actually put pen to paper, you can actually do certain things to help encourage these young people during these times. Um, you, you know, um, so, so thank you, I, I appreciate that, truly. In doing the, 
doing the 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 research the the necessary work to be able to to do this right um and i i can completely see where that would be both a, a beautiful and a horrifying thing um the the depths that you had to go to in order to be able to get this right can you talk a little bit about i don't know just some of the things that that were enlightening or some of the things that made you go damn or or like i in the interview that ahmed was talking about um a little earlier i don't think that it was you who said it but one of your your colleagues that were on the the panel they were talking about a a statistic a prison statistic um i think it was maybe in, in arkansas that gang activity it's not black people that are the majority of people that are doing the gang activity they they talked about that it, it's a stark majority not it's a stark majority white folks that are kind of in this area that are engaging in gang related activity yet disproportionately it's uh black and latino men in that area that are are locked up for gang related activity and so just the the disproportion that struck me hard um can, so can you i don't know just talk about other just sort of enlightening or just like fuck things that that came that you learned through that process oh yeah um one of the hardest things and i i've, I've talked about this i feel like a lot today this is i don't know how many zooms i've done today but it's um that one of the hardest scenes um to actually put into the film is uh the sexual abuse scene um, but it kept coming up in my research. It kept coming up. And I, I was like, Lord, how do I, how do I do this? Because um, it's, it's, it's prevalent. It, it happens. Um, for those that are trying to understand what I'm talking about, there's a scene where a guard uh, sexually abuses this young boy. And um, I think that was probably the hardest thing to figure out how to do this, how to show this in a way, um, regardless, some might find it triggering, but for me, it's like, how, how do I show this in, in a, a sensitive manner that gives you just enough information to know that something, lots of things need to change and that things need to be done. Um, honestly, it, take, it took a lot of conversation between my team um, really having conversation with my close advisors and saying, you know, can I do this? And then really getting on Zoom while we were in rehearsal in Martha's Vineyard and showing them, this is what I want to do. This is what it looks like. This is how we plan on shooting it. You know, I think it really took a team of people to support me in making that happen because um, particularly something like that is it, something that's never shown in ballet. It's not talked about. I mean, you know, that's not, that's not classical ballet to the ballet purist. Um, but that's the thing about, I feel like about my work is that I, I try to really go there um, so that we can really have honest conversations about these experiences and, and what they're like um, and, and how even you know, what someone might think is, is, is not being a primary aspect of that person's development. You know, a lot of these experiences of isolation and, and um, the challenges they face behind bars, even just the communication um, or lack thereof um, can really have long-term effects on early childhood development. Um, so it's, um, it's been a lot, a lot, but um like I said, it's, it's a weighted responsibility and it's work, work that I'm willing to do um, because for, for a lot of people, they can't turn this on and off. Um, you know, this is their life day in and day out. And so to be able to have this opportunity to share these stories is, is an honor. How do you release it? I mean, in the end for yourself, the things that you're, how, how do you release it? Oh my gosh, yes, I have to have a practice. Like we, we're in rehearsals now for Entre Act. Um, we start with a practice and we end with encouraging people to do what they do. Um, one of the things that's always helped me is chocolate. Um, I love C's candies, I'm San Diego through and through. Uh, C's candies, we, I couldn't get here when I was in college. Um, but what I used to do is I used to get Godiva chocolate. So between Fordham University and Alvin Ailey on 55th Street, there was Columbus Circle. And in that mall, there's a, a store called uh, Godiva chocolate. 
And I used to go in there between uh, my last dance class and my last academic class of the day when I had a break and I would spend, I would save, you know, five, six dollars uh, just so that I could indulge and splurge on some expensive chocolate. And I would buy two to three truffles because, you know, Godiva is expensive. And I would take those truffles in my little gold bag and I would put in my headphones. I'd walk to Central Park. And it was one of the moments where I just kind of shut everything else off in the world. And it was just a collective breath, um, just really being able to look around and just give thanks for where I am right now. As I had alluded to before, you know, understanding that it's important to, to recognize where you are despite all the challenges and maybe you haven't achieved the success that you want, but even just being right here where you are is a blessing. And so taking time to be cognizant of that and to um, relish in things that, that, that make my spirit feel so full and uplift me um, was important. So uh, Godiva Friday was what it eventually was called when my friends started poking fun at me and I just started to give into it and lean into it. Um, so that's something that I do now too on a daily, you know, uh, whether it be meditation, I pray a lot, um, meditation, Godiva, um, and then my other one is, is reality TV, like reality, <laughs> for lack of a better word, trash TV, like right before mm -hmm. this interview to decompress between the heavy day that I had and this interview right now, I just put on Real Housewives of New Jersey for just 20 minutes <laughs> yes. because it, it just provides me the opportunity to kind of like shut it off and like turn on something else. And to me, I don't see reality TV as being real. I see it almost like a caricature. Um, so, so a lot of it's just, you know, it, it's kind of like mind numbing for me, entertainment. Um, so, so that's a part of my practice as well. And then I'm very cognizant about my weekends are for me. They are not for work. I don't yeah. respond to work emails. I try not to do yeah. research on the weekends unless there's something that really compels and drives my heart to do that. But making sure that I create clear work-life boundaries um, has been very instrumental during this, this process. What's that like? No, just kidding. <laughs> um, but no, I, have, I, I'm, I think you'll, you'll appreciate this. Um, there, Yolanda Franklin is a, a phenomenal woman in town, multi-hyphenate Black artist here in our community. And she pointed out to me that Godiva, if you look at it another way, is also go diva. So <laughs> when you need your little go diva chocolate, you take it. You take it. And yes. Yep. Now we have C's here. So I, I'm always getting my C's in the city and savoring it in the, in the refrigerator and reserves for whenever I need it. Yes. That's yes. right. <laughs> um, talk to me a little bit about your feelings and thoughts about where we, you know, where we are right now, where we've been over the last year, year and a half, it seems like, you know, um, we're now on the precipice. I know, you know, I, I don't know things are different state to state, but I mean, as far as theater goes, you know, we're on the precipice of getting this thing back to where we can actually back. have live audiences again and real opening nights and things <laughs> such as that. Um, give me a little bit of your thought on, on thoughts on where just where you think we are in, in, in the moment overall. Yeah, for the long, you know, for the longest time, it's been hard to um, to talk about where we are or, or where people think we are, because I feel like what a lot of what I've experienced, particularly over the summer and early into the fall was performative solidarity. Mm -hmm. um, as organizations were very quick to try to combat years of, of um, racial silencing or um, just racial nonchalance. Um, so, you know, I'm optimistic. I'm always trying to look at the, the glass half full versus half empty. Um, so I, I'm, I'm hopeful that when theater and dance and the arts really come back full swing, that it will be even more colorful and even more vibrant than it had been in the past. And I do see ways in which that it's already starting to change. And I love it even from just being able to have conversations like this so openly with all of you across the three organizations. I think it's so beautiful. Um, so I, I, I look forward to, to really being able to engage audiences even more deeply now, now that these conversations have really come to a head and people are starting to be a, a more cognizant and we're willing to learn um, about our experiences and really finding ways to truly amplify Black voices and the Black experience. Um, 
so so like I said, yeah, I'm very optimistic. We we are are slowly getting back to live performances as well, which I I can't wait for. Um, but for me, it's always been about access and trying to find ways to continue to inspire and uplift our communities in particular. Um, and that's what got me into the medium of film before the pandemic even started, before it became necessity to, to film your performances or live stream them, whatnot. Um, film was something that I started dabbling into in 2018 with a ballet that I created entitled The Mother's Right. And um, that film actually went on to be nominated for a New York Emmy Award. Um, and it was just, it really opened my eyes to, to new ways that we can reach audiences. And I, and I think that that's one of the positives of this, um, of this really challenging year that we've had of the pandemic is being able to connect with people literally from all over the world and all over the country on, on such much more meaningful uh, levels than, than we've had the ability to in the past. And so I look forward to that continuing as we move forward into this, this new normal. Absolutely. Yeah, I love it. It's because we can't go back to the old normal that that wasn't working. So we, I, yeah, I, I am very excited to see the way that young artists and seasoned artists are using their voices in a way um, that, that they haven't before. Even I saw that uh, Thandie Newton has gone back to, to using the Zimbabwe spelling of her name. Like, why do we have to, to sugarcoat ourselves? Why do we have to make ourselves more palatable? Um, you know, Karen Olivo using her voice to say, no, I'm not doing this anymore. I'm not coming back to Moulin Rouge. That is a toxic environment. We shouldn't, that shouldn't be acceptable anymore. Oh, was yeah. that what happened today? Yeah. Oh, I'm, I I'm saw something. I, I am greatly paraphrasing, but yeah. yeah. Yeah, no, I am not gonna return to an environment that yeah. I don't feel valued and appreciated. Wow. Yeah, wow. I, I mean, wow. there's, there's, a, it, it's happening. People, there's a, a young, I'm not going to call it out, but there's a young San Diego artist who used her voice, who's, who saw that that happened, and she's now living in New York, came up in San Diego, but she said, you know what? I had a toxic experience working on a show in San Diego, and I'm going to mm. speak on it because I need mm. to, because I can't be silent anymore, because we can't any longer say, uh, that's just old Hollywood. Uh, that's just how directors are. Uh, that's just how producers are. No, it's unacceptable. It should have never been acceptable in the first place. But as you said earlier, we feel like we need to struck and we feel like we need to just become palatable and yes, sir, no, sir, you know, oh, I'll do the thing. Yeah. Oh, you want me to be LL Cool J? Yeah, I'll be LL Cool J because even though that's nothing in my essence, but sure, I will bend myself into whatever it is you need me to be because I need a job. You know what? Fuck it. I don't need a job that much. I don't need a job that bad. Um, and I know we're running on to out of time and we need to be very respectful of you because it's coming up on 10 o'clock where you are at. Uh, but there, there's just, there's, there's still so many things I could go on with this conversation forever. We didn't get to go into the code switching. I really wanted to ask about Elsa, but take it off the green, you know, it's, <laughs> I got time, you know? I got time, I got time. Oh, let's talk that, about that. So, yeah, so that's, that. I, I will, that's, that, that's the last thing that, that I'll bring up. Cause that was really that woo, hit me in that interview. Um, you had mentioned that you, you, you toured with wicked and there was always that moment of watching alpha, but make herself colored and then decolor herself at the end of the show. And you know what? I negotiate as an agent, I used to negotiate a number of alpha contracts and them heifers get, get facials and shit put into their contracts because it's really stressful on the skin to be able to have to do that and take that makeup on and off every day. Like no, no shade to Elphaba's because that's a hard fucking job. That's a hard fucking job, but nah, mm -hmm. they, they get facials because they have to take <laughs> that color off, you know? So I was, was that ever like part of the conversation? Because I will also say ain't a whole lot of black munchkins running around either. There, there is not a whole lot of diversity in Munchkin land. And I will tell you at one point, I represented 12 ensemble members in the sit down LA company. I can't tell you that many of them were people of color. 
So I, I'm just curious, was that, was that ever acknowledged? Was it because this is a show about uh, differences and, and embracing and, and stop, you know, just cause you got a tail anyway. So would you like to speak on that a little bit? Jeremy? Oh yeah. See, now sure. you want me going. <laughs> <laughs> no, sure. I mean, all of these things, all of these things, I mean, I guess I've, planted these various seeds in various different interviews, but I, I've never felt so comfortable as I do now and sharing um, so transparently uh, about all of these things. You know, a lot of people were sharing in June and July, and that was one of those times where I was like, you know what, I'm gonna let them speak. You know, there'll be a time and a place we, I, we, can, we need to carry these conversations on. But Wicked was another one of those experiences that truly led me to wanting to create the Black Iris Project, to being able to tell our own stories, because I can't tell you, I, I loved the women that play Alphaba. And I still, my boyfriend and I were just sitting on the couch the other night and I was pulling up, you know, bootlegs on YouTube of various women singing, no good deed, you know? And so I love it, but it, it was another one of those situations, um, definitely not as bad as in the Heights, but it definitely was like, the, the cultural sensitivity of the situation just was not there. And, and the cultural representation was not there ever. Um, I was one of three black people on my tour. Uh, you would only generally see two people, uh, two black people on stage every night, one black boy, one black girl. Um, and what the track that I had or the, the ensemble role that I had was the black boy track, typically known as that. Um, and it was kind of a one for one situation. Yeah. Oh, yeah. There was tons I, I of. I never casting. heard that. All of the contracts I did for Wicked over the years, I, I never heard that. But shit. Oh, yeah. I mean, you know, I, I had been in for Wicked probably around nine times over the course of four years. And my agent would often come back to me and say, oh, it's just not the right track for you. You know, there's other ways that they like to fluff it and make it, you know, sound colorful oh, yeah. and whatever. But oh. I always knew. Um, I always knew because I knew the people that were dancing my track on Broadway and I would always see it was a black guy, then another black guy, then another black guy. And um, I also yeah. saw the trends when I would go in for callbacks. If I was in a room surrounded by nothing but black men, I knew that that track was open and that they were going to hire someone that day. And that's when I got my job. I walked into the audition and I said, oh, okay, so we're serious today. Okay, let's, it's time to book a show. Um, but it, I hate, wow. you know, I really hated that experience because then it's not even just that I'm going up against my friends, my peers, my colleagues right. that I admire, that I love. And I didn't like that. They're essentially putting black people up against one another. So for you know, the one available, available track. Exactly. And then, you know, it just comes down to, um, you know, just cultural sensitivity. You know, one, I had replaced another black guy. And I had probably been in the cast for maybe a, a week or two. And uh, this, this woman in the cast go, comes over to me and it's like, oh, thank God you're not like so-and-so other black man that was in your track. Mm -hmm. Yep. All things, all things that were said, you know, it's like they start to, they start to see, uh, they started specifically starting to see the, the black men in these tracks as difficult, as challenging as whatnot. But at the same time, when I saw it, I was like, oh wait, like the amount of code switching that I have to do in order to be here and to be seen and recognized and accepted, it, it was insane. So it got to a point where I was like, there's no way that I can continue this because there's clear double standards with how certain people were allowed to behave versus myself as a black man. And um, I ended up having, I, you know, I, I put it, put in my notice and I, I left the show because um, it was a show that I had always wanted to be in and I loved so much. And, um, but it just, um, I feel like God only puts you in situations when you're really, really able and ready to uh, meet them head on. And I think that that's one of the reasons why I didn't get that show for so long was because he was like, nah, you ain't ready yet. Because when I got there, I literally was like, wow, like, wow. I mean, I was even a monkey in the show. I was a monkey, um, which yeah. I, I feel no problem with that, but it was just, um, it, just uh, yes, Elphaba, the, the way she would do her interviews, um, and they would videotape her. The popular trend was that the news crews would come and they would watch her become green. And that was probably the most annoying thing to hear. 
Um, and then to continually see them never really casting a black woman to be the lead role. Um, when the entire time I'm sitting there crying, waving a cape during Defying Gravity because I understand this experience so deeply than so many others. Um, it was just, it was challenging. It was a beautiful, uh, but challenging experience definitely as a black person. So I hope that when Broadway does come back and that when this movie is made that they will do the right thing and cast a black woman as Elphaba because um, it's really a black woman's story. I believe that Seikon Senblo is the only black Elphaba. Am I wrong about that? Have there been others since her? I know she was the first for sure. Have there been others? Yeah, um, yeah, there's been others. Seikon was, I believe, a uh, standby on Broadway. And so she went on a number of times. Um, Danielle Williamson, she was in the Chicago cast. She was an understudy Elphaba. Mm -hmm. uh, Brandy Siobhan Massey, she was in, she was an understudy Elphaba in the Broadway company and she went on a number of times. Okay. Um, there's been a, okay. there's been a full-time Elphaba. Uh, I forget what her name is, but she's in uh, the UK, a uh, full-time black Elphaba. To my of course knowledge, the UK. <laughs> to my knowledge, there's never been a full-time black Elphaba on Broadway. But you're right, it's a black girl but story. But, but they're in there, they're, they're in there. Mm -hmm. um, they're just not in there and out there to the front as as most most people are. And it's probably not as exciting just to watch a black girl turn green. <laughs> <laughs> but I'm so surprised that you knew about the, the, the facials and stuff, because that is real life hearing people talk about their exfoliants and their process. And I'm just like, okay, it's time for me to go because I can't, <laughs> I got to go to my hotel room and I got to like have my glass of wine because I can't hear you talk about this anymore. <laughs> oh yeah, no, it was always a negotiation point on an alphabet contract, whether it was a standby, whether it was an understudy, whether it was a whatever, getting the number of facials per week that we would get negotiated into that contract. Wow, I didn't know about per week. Wow. Yes, sir. <laughs> yeah that work too. so that's that wicked <laughs> i'm mad why don't you take us home <laughs> <laughs> real quickly uh when can we look forward to and at two uh, are we looking forward uh, to an act two? <laughs> no, you are, you <laughs> how about are. that question first <laughs> Um, Entre, Entre Act is actually going to be a live experience. It's, uh, it happens May 15th. We are going to film it for later distribution, um, but that's not currently planned as to when and how that will be distributed. But the live experience will be a socially distant bike excursion throughout the Bronx where we'll travel uh, to five different locations and at each location um, in small groups of 20 bikers. Um, audience members will have an opportunity to experience the story of uh, a, a young man from the Bronx uh, who is impacted by the juvenile justice system. So um, that happens May 15th here in New York City and uh, tickets will be going on sale soon for that. It's somewhat of a pop-up experience. Um, and uh, Act Two will be unveiled uh, around September, mid-September. Uh, National Dance Day is our uh, our, our target at the moment, but we, we do have very sizable goals for this work. Uh, we are definitely looking at Netflix or HBO Max, or we're really trying to see how we can get this work shown on a, a larger scale and, and really further, um, further reach audiences around the globe to really further these conversations and really uplift and amplify these necessary black and brown voices. Now that live theater is coming back, is there a world in which you take the live show to different cities? Yeah, um, Overture will always stay a film. Act one will be act one of a live performance. Um, Entre Act will be a socially distant experience that's created for whatever city we're going to. So if it's Philadelphia, um, I would work with young people in Philadelphia as well as professional dancers there. And it would be a similar bike excursion that would be specific to that neighborhood and, and that community. Um, and then Act Two will be Act Two of that evening, Act One, Act Two. So that's the, that's the goal. Um, I'm not sure when we'll be able to do that. I know theaters are, are struggling um, you know, across the globe right now. So especially like bringing a show like ours in um, 
you know, I don't know when that'll happen, but there's always been goals and hopes that I'll be able to bring this work to San Diego or bring any of our works to San Diego and further um, impact and share with the San Diego community that I hold so dear in my heart. That's right. That's right. Love it. Well, you know what? Let's let, let's wrap this thing up. Everybody, please make sure you visit blackirisproject.org. If I, I put the link in the chat, um, you can copy it there. Also visit their YouTube page. A lot of great and beautiful videos there. Please make sure you check it out. Jeremy, thank you so much for joining. This has been a spectacular, spectacular conversation, which I knew it would be. Um, just thank you so much for talking to us and, and spending time with us. We, we really appreciate it. Again, Jacole, happy early birthday. Thank and you. Congratulations yeah. on a new position and title. And everybody, please make sure you, again, visit blackirisproject.org. Make sure you visit sdrep.org, visit lahoyaplayhouse.org, and visit oldglobe.org. And with that being said, everybody, Jeremy, again, thank you very much. And everybody, have a good night. And have a spectacular weekend, and we'll see you in a couple of weeks. Good night, everybody. Thanks for listening. Okay.